Okay, welcome everybody. Um, and thank you for coming to our session on nurturing a trauma-informed family defense workplace. Um, my name is Kathleen Creamer. I'm the managing attorney of the Family Advocacy Unit at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. And I'm joined by Maggie Potter, who's a social worker in my office. Um, we are really excited to be here with you guys in this virtual space, uh, but we really wish we were here in person with you because um, we want to hear from you and we wish we could do as much interaction as possible. It's such a bummer. I can't even see your faces, but I want to take a few moments for us all to introduce ourselves. And um, if you could like follow the prompt on the screen and just put in the chat your name, your role, and something that you did in the last 30 days to relieve stress. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing a bunch of your chat as we go. Just FYI, um, we're gonna use the chat feature instead of the question feature. So if you have questions as we go along, just put them in the chat just so we're not toggling back and forth. Um, and, uh, and then also, if you're interested, the files are in a tab here. And one of the files we put, we already put it in the chat, the ground rules for um, for kind of our conversations. I'm, like I said, I want it to be as much of a conversation as possible. Um, so again, please put in the chat your name and your role and something that you did in the last 30 days to relieve stress. And I'm actually going to ask my friend Maggie Potter, what's something you did in the last 30 days to relieve stress? Um, I just saw that Brenna put in got a massage, and that's what I was thinking of putting in because I um, recently went and got a massage for the first time in over a year. And it was so, so lovely and stress relieving and muscle tension relieving and highly recommend. Um, yeah, I... I um, want to also just say how excited that I am to be here. I am, I always love this conference. I am also sad that we can't see each other's faces, but we are very excited to have, I see lots of folks weighing in in the chat and we hope that that will be the case throughout. Um, wanted to just invite everybody also in this moment to just like take a moment to appreciate that we're here doing this for ourselves. This is kind of like a um, something we're doing to potentially relieve stress or connect with others, even through this virtual um, platform and and maybe just like take a deep breath in and out and just like, yeah, I don't know, like feel an appreciation for, yes, Marty was so empowering. Marty was so <laughs> inspiring. I got a little emotional at the end. Um, so yeah, we're just super excited and want to honor the fact that like this session and and this conference is also a an act of self-care for, for many of us, including myself. Totally. Um, and I love looking at the answers in the chat. We're going to have other questions for you. Um, oh, Rebecca, play with a baby. I wish I had a baby to play with. We all, we were just talking yesterday in our unit about how we all love babies. <laughs> My baby's 10. Um, I, just to join in the fun, um, one thing that I found so helpful um, during the pandemic, and I do it almost every day, is go for a really long walk. I've had like it's like been the nice kind of silver lining of COVID that the, one of the things that's actually okay to do <laughs> is go for a walk by yourself. And so I've taken some like really long, dreamy, beautiful walks um, around Philadelphia. And I just, I love this city. It's just been, that's been such a wonderful way for me to relieve stress. Um, so we can get started. I, I just, I'm gonna go over a little bit and please keep putting it in. Um, the chat because I definitely want to like learn from you guys. Um, just what we're gonna, I just want to go over what we're gonna talk about today and why, and maybe I could just tell you a little bit more about me, and Maggie could tell you a little bit more about herself. Um, so, uh, first of all, I just want to say in introduction. Um, I'm really inspired and motivated by this topic, but I recognize that I don't have all the answers. And that's one of the reasons why we want to use the chat is that um, there is no easy answer to burnout and stress and the stress of this work. And so we're constantly learning um, in our unit and we want to learn from you. And I hope that this can be as collaborative a process as possible. Um, 
So, and then I also want to say, we're going to talk about some strategies for the office, but we also really want to recognize not everybody gets to practice in an office. Like, I can't believe I get to have social workers in my office. Social workers make everything better when they're actual social workers. Um, and so it's so awesome to work with in an office that's multidisciplinary and that has social workers, but we recognize lots of folks out there are solo practitioners doing this by themselves. And we still know there are strategies that can help you. Um, so first, we're going to talk a little bit about if you are a supervisor in an office, what can you do to really invest in your staff and invest in the kind of office culture that's going to help people kind of stay with this for the long haul and like thrive and do well on it. Maggie's going to spend some time talking about trauma and how applying a trauma lens to ourselves and, and the work that we do is so critical. And then, you know, we know that Trauma is not a, not um, determinative of our outcomes. Like trauma has to be paired with resilience, and so that's how we move forward. And um, and then we're going to spend a little bit at the end circling back to what we started with, which is how do you model self care? And you're going to hear from us repeatedly. One thing you have to do is just keep talking about it. So we're going to give you some specific strategies to kind of call it out within your own office, and then also to just kind of call it out in your daily self care practice. Um, Maggie, is there anything else you wanted to say? Uh, no, I think we can okay. keep it moving. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I just so to tell you a little bit more about me, I joined the Family Advocacy Unit um, in 2006. And so I was a family defense attorney for a number of years. And then in 2015, I got promoted to managing attorney. And at the time that I got promoted, um, I was in a very, very low burnout kind of place. Um, and then I was put in a position to, to really um, recognize that I, I, have, I have to do something not only to protect myself from burnout, but also to like support my staff. And of course, anybody who's a lawyer knows nobody teaches you any of this stuff in law school. Um, so I've studied a lot. I've tried to learn. And again, I learning is a lifelong process when the challenges are so hard. So when we've done this in person, we've actually asked the audience to call this out. But um, since we're virtual, I'm just going to articulate what I think are the really significant challenges to staying in this work for a long time. Um, you, and I just want to say, Family defenders are my heroes and, and, and folks who do it well and stay with it are absolutely my heroes because this is such hard work, right? So we know that family defenders don't get paid what they deserve to get paid. We know very many people are being underpaid for their work. We also know that there's a lot of stigma to this work. People don't, when you go to a cocktail party and someone says, what do you do? And you say, I represent parents in the child welfare system. You kind of get that like kind of two understand the work they definitely devalue and demean our clients regularly right and that results in kind of constant unrelenting injustice because our clients are are persistently devalued in every single place they go to and often we're the only thing between them and a just outcome um uh, the wins are very hard to get, right? This is a system that is very tilted away from parent power and parents um, even getting a just or fair outcome. Uh, I've thought of despair in two different ways. Um, despair, like, what am I actually doing here? Am I actually helping somebody, right? Does, does what I do make any difference here? I keep on filing motions. I keep on making objections. No one listens to me. And then I've also heard despair defined as um, the belief that tomorrow is going to be just the same as today. And um, in some way, um, when I have a nice long walk, I'm like, that sounds good. <laughs> but, but if you're kind of doing family defense every day, that sense that you're on Groundhog Day and you're still seeing the same things over and over and over again. And that really drives um, traumatic stress and burnout for a lot of us. Um, I also just want to call out that uh, this work has been as hard as it is and as much as people say at cocktail parties, wow, I don't know how you do that. Um, imagine doing it during COVID. <laughs> imagine doing it during a global pandemic. Um, and so I just want to call out that not only are you guys doing some of the hardest work I could possibly imagine in the legal profession, you are doing it in, in the middle of a global pandemic and you've been faced with all of these new challenges um, of course, we all recognize that while we're going through these challenges, like what's happening next? Am I safe? 
Am I going to be able to keep paying my mortgage? Um, is my family going to be safe? How, how am I going to take care of my child? <laughs> All of those questions that we've kind of been, um, have been thrust upon us in the global pandemic are, are obviously all worse for our clients. And then of course, um, the fact that our clients can't be with us makes it harder. I mean, I, I hope that you share my kind of joy at, at the client work. And I, that's often what keeps me going is knowing that I can connect with my clients and I can help them. And so now I can't see my clients They're They are, you know, struggling to connect with me. And so that's a whole new challenge. Um, so how do we manage this? And so um, we're going to talk a lot about what a trauma-informed workplace looks like, but I just want to spend a couple of slides talking about if you are a supervisor or a manager or somebody who's like trying to help people stay motivated to stay in their jobs, there are a couple of things you can learn from the literature that I have found very helpful. So uh, I, I love this one because um, I, I hope you know who this is. This is Don Draper from Mad Men. Um, Don Draper was a ter terrible boss. Um, I, I'm not sure how many of you guys watch Mad Men, but there was an episode where um, it's called The Suitcase and Peggy, who's his young kind of protege, who is an incredible ad woman, um, goes to Don and says, you're always praised, you're getting awards, you're famous, everybody knows you. And what am I doing here? Like, I don't get any praise. I don't get any recognition. Um, and Don Draper screams at her. That's what's the what the money is for. That is where you get your recognition. That is where you get your job satisfaction. I'm paying you a salary. That's what the salary is for. So um, Don Draper knows nothing about management and supervision um, because what we know for sure is that money is important for folks who are not able to meet their needs, right? So if you are so underpaid that you don't know where your rent is coming for, from or you don't know if you can pay your student loans or you don't know if you can pay your utility bill, money is a very high priority for employee satisfaction and retention. Once you get to kind of adequate compensation, money is actually not a big driver of employee retention. So what helps people stay? Why do people stay at really hard and challenging jobs? I like, I kind of created a Venn diagram out of this article because I thought it was so helpful. There are three things that people are looking for in a job. And, and this applies across any jobs. If we were in a factory kind of making widgets, we would still want these things out of a job. Um, one is a cause, and I just want to start with cause because I, I hope that's one of the easiest things to identify in family defense. And I think Marty kind of got us fired up of like, we are on the side of help families get through this terrible system of oppression and we're doing it together. Um, so that cause feels kind of natural to me and I hope it does to you. Um, and places like this are great places to remind us of what is our cause here. Career is the idea of, I know what my place is and I see a path for growth and development, right? So here's what I have in front of me and here's how I know I can keep getting better at it, keep learning more, keep doing more as my career progresses. So everyone needs to feel like they have a career path in front of them. And then this last one is so important and I know it's such a challenge for solo practitioners, which is why I'm so glad we have a space like this, is a sense of community. Like Belonging is one of the most important things you can have in a workplace, a sense that you are part of a team, that you belong, that you have people there to support you and who, who appreciate you for who you are. Um, so, and then this is, this kind of is like the, if you're not a diagram person, this is the word version of that, right? So like, what does an individual need if they're trying um, to succeed in work and, and to stay in a job that's really challenging. Autonomy is something that's really important. Like, I don't know if any of you have ever worked for a micromanager or somebody who doesn't trust you to do this really hard work and make the really difficult judgment calls that you have to make every five minutes in family defense. That is really important to feel, feel respected and valued. Opportunities to know and do better like this, right? An opportunity to come to a conference, learn new skills, um, sense of, again, going back to that sense of belonging, community and group identity, and then the cause, the belief in the value of the work. Um, so this is where I want to kind of 
um, here. Oh, how am I doing this? Oh, there it goes. I want to hear from you guys and Maggie and I can talk about some of our ideas. But you, we know that um, if we're in a in an uh, office where we're trying to think through how do we keep people engaged with this work? How do we keep them wanting to show up for work every day? Like I think a lot about like what what makes my employees not my employees, my the staff that I work with, like want to get out of bed every day and come in and do this really hard work. And so there are things that you can try. Um, and I really want to hear what you guys have tried. So if you could put your ideas in the chat, I would love to hear some of your ideas. Um, Maggie, I'm going to, I feel like I've been talking a lot. So I'm going to turn it over to you if you want to call out any of the things we do in our office. And I have some suggestions, but I also want to hear what other folks are doing to do this. Yeah, so hopefully, oh, I love that, celebrate the small stuff. Um, mm -hmm. We do, like, along those lines of what Rebecca just mentioned, at the, we have a couple um, unit meetings a week to just stay connected to each other during remote work. And we always, almost always spend a little bit of time at the beginning of the meeting um, checking in on some former fashion. Sometimes it's like a silly question. Sometimes it's like a high-low Um and also doing shout outs at the end of the meeting. So um, making sure to just like celebrate the small stuff exactly, what, or maybe the big stuff, whatever it is that, that we might be wanting to shout out or thank each other for. So I, I think that is a really big um, boost of like connection to each other to do that check-in and to also give each other those little warm fuzzies and thank yous regularly. And what are some shout outs that we've had in our unit, just to give people examples of what we mean when we say shout each other out? Yeah, I think like in some of the most recent ones, like one of our um, administrative staff has been off for the last couple of weeks. So a lot of us are covering the phones, covering, um, you know, if there are petitions coming in from the court and um, picking up each other's slack and just little shout outs like that of like thanking somebody for helping open a petition, open like a case in, in our online database or or making sure the phone call got answered if somebody got swamped with the hotline was ringing off the hook that morning. Um, but also like just if somebody got like some sort of win on a case, somebody made, you know, I, I, you know, thanking somebody if they made a phone call on a case where something big is blowing up, but you were in court all day and the social worker or the paralegal made sure to attend a meeting for you or, or make a phone call and just all of those little things. Yeah, I, I love that. And often like the shout outs are small and big. And I think just like that time that we take every time we convene to kind of thank each other for the work that we are doing to support one another feels like very important and helps people recognize that you do belong here. You're part of this team and we're grateful for you for doing this work. Um, and then some of the shout outs are just really like random. Like, like our, our newest staff attorney is helping everybody in the unit who wants to be and she will get on the phone and off. <laughs> and that's amazing. So we'll shout out Layla Barry. Like my sunflower is finally growing, right? Like just little things like that. But also, the, you know, the big thing, like you want a huge case in this in the Superior Court, which is our appellate court or whatever. So I, I love that space that we create for each other. Maggie, you mentioned highs and lows. Um, that's something we do every now and again at unit meetings where each per we go through each person and have them share the high point of their last week um or two weeks and then the low point right and so you really get a sense of like what's going on in this person's practice and again some of the highs or lows are um you know i finally figured out how to um ron is like our other social worker is building little miniature ships and he's like i finally got that thing together right but then that could be his high for the week but often they're very related to the work that we're doing um uh, one thing that we did before the pandemic that we um have stopped doing, but I can't wait to start doing them again, is employee of the month. So every um, every at every staff meeting, we would have one person of our team who's the employee of the month, and everybody would write, um, respond to a little prompt on a little kind of post-it note, right? And so the prompt is something like, Maggie Potter is awesome because, and then everybody would write on the note, why is Maggie Potter awesome? And then at the end of my staff meeting, I would read out, from all 15 of us, pe people's answers to that question. Um, I, I, we also in our at our office um, have more formal ways to kind of shout out people beyond unit meetings. Like we have our office wide because we're a large civil legal aid organization, and we have an office wide kind of 
weekly wins where people send in kind of what they've accomplished during the week or what they're proud of. And so we often like will shout each other out through the weekly wins and say, guess what? Maggie just helped win this giant case. And here's why it's so important to our client. Um, so I think that's been really helpful. And Maggie, I know you've been watching the chat. Are there any ideas that folks are are having that you think are like we should elevate? Yeah, I, I well, I'm going to miss some. So I apologize if I'm not shouting out all of them. But somebody said um, going out and delivering like little goodie bags or like small kind of gifts mm -hmm. to all of the staff during this remote work time or scheduling something where everyone can come together outdoors to connect. I've seen that definitely happening um, with uh, my office as well, sometimes with other units and stuff. And I think that that is so important, the like in-person connection when possible. And when, you know, if it has to be outdoors or whatever during this time and the little thing that I loved that idea of giving kind of like a little goodie bag for everybody that maybe makes them all feel kind of like, oh, we're all enjoying the same, you know, candy or we're all <laughs> like, you know, using a gift card to the same lunch spot together and then eating. <laughs> um, we did that at one of the one of a different um, group meeting that I was at. They they gave us each a gift card to the same spot, and then we had a big retreat for the day, and everybody could order there, <laughs> you know, if lunch would have been provided. But yeah, I love some of these ideas. Definitely keep them coming. And so there's something about food. There's something about like bonding over food and meals that just feels really uh, elemental, like something that we all do with our families, and it's such such, such a nice thing to do together. Yeah, um, another one of the ones that was mentioned I'm remembering was like making time to have special lunches with like newer, especially with newer staff, I think they said. Mm -hmm. um, I want to turn now to the tr the trauma piece of all of this um, and turn it over to Maggie. So Maggie, just tell me when you want me to move stuff forward. Yeah, go ahead and switch to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to try to go through some of the basic trauma stuff pretty quickly because I feel like we added quite a lot of new material about COVID and 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 I want to make sure we get through everything. But um, just quickly talking about trauma, um, I, I think about these quotes a lot in regards to our clients and the kind of vicarious trauma that we may be experiencing. But um, sometimes trauma is used to describe experiences that are emotionally painful and distressing and that overwhelm people's ability to cope, leaving them powerless. Um, it can sometimes be defined in reference to circumstances that are outside the realm of normal human experience, but often that doesn't hold true with our clients. We see clients um, in family law with, um, they are experiencing layers of trauma, different types of trauma. They're, they're, um, they're not necessarily, it has become kind of that's something that occurs frequently and has become part of their common human experience. Um, and in addition to terrifying events such as violence and assault, which our clients do experience, we also believe that subtler and insidious forms of trauma like discrimination, racism, oppression, and poverty are pervasive and when experienced chronically have a cumulative impact that can be life altering. And I think that that is, again, something that we see day in and day out with the clients that we work with. And, and I think Marty and Aisha also kind of referenced that in the in the plenary. Um, next slide. Um, again, sometimes some people really appreciate visuals. I think this is an awesome visual for the idea for a lot of different kind of concepts, but certainly for trauma, the idea that what we're seeing on the surface of, of any given individual that we're interacting with, whether it's our staff or our client or ourselves or the judge, um, you know, we're seeing just what's above the water, what's visible, their behavior, what they're saying, how they're reacting to us. And it can be really helpful just to remember that there's a lot going on below the surface that we um, may not be aware of, or, or maybe we know some of, but not all of. And it can really impact on how they, it's their beliefs, their their attachment history, their, their family history, what maybe what happens, you know, what's going on at home for them and, and outside of the realm that we're seeing them in. And so just keeping that in mind can really help us go a long way towards helping us be trauma informed, even um, just to know that, that what we're doing and seeing is only part of the picture. Next slide. Um, and then I've, I've recently, um, a colleague shared this woman, Jen Alexander's blog with me. She's an educator. Um, I'm gonna talk about her again in a little bit, but I've just found her blog post on trauma really interesting and really, thought provoking and I have added this slide about going kind of going beyond the iceberg and really kind of incorporating oppression into the idea of the iceberg and thinking about when we talk about trauma, we're not always 
incorporating the idea of historical trauma and ongoing marginalization of groups and that 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 directly causes trauma and perpetuates power differentials and systems of oppression which then sort of cyclically make individuals and families even more vulnerable to continued trauma and we can't be trauma informed if we're not fighting injustice and so that piece is really important i think to keep in mind um and helps us connect back to that idea that Kathleen was saying of like the cause and, and connecting with each other about this cause. Um, we have to go deeper into the iceberg and this wider with our understanding and asking not just what might have happened to you or what might be happening to you, but also what's contributed to what is happening to you and how might my biases and assumptions be problematic when we're thinking about what has happened. Um, next slide. Um, and then there's these other forms of trauma. These are kind of the pieces that we might be experiencing as social workers and interdisciplinary teams um, working in parent defense, vicarious trauma. We're hearing these really difficult, sad experiences. We're watching them play out. Um, compassion fatigue is when we start to get kind of exhausted by the continued um, expression of compassion that we need to bring to our jobs. It's this gradual erosion of our ability to feel empathy and hope and, and our compassion for others and ourselves. Um, burnout can be, you know, something that happens when someone has low job satisfaction and feels like Kathleen was talking about the idea of feeling like I can't, can I even make a difference? And I feel overwhelmed by my caseload and by how much there is to change. And can I even, you know, make a difference in this work? And secondary trauma, similar to vicarious trauma, when you're exposed to someone's trauma secondhand. And we're hearing stories about trauma, but we're also witnessing traumatic hearings, traumatic meetings, traumatic separations play out and, and relapses and, and, and just actual in the moment traumas that are happening for our clients um, all the time. Next slide, Kathleen. There you go. Oh, and oh. then we wanted to add about racial trauma as yeah, well. Yeah, so um, one of the materials you have um, is a um, family justice initiative just put out a really great guide on um, managing vicarious. Uh oh, Kathleen is frozen on my screen. Um, so maybe I'll just jump in and <laughs> talk a little bit about this. Um, but we're we're in a system that is perpetuating racism and racialized harm. And that can be a real source of, yeah, Kathleen is frozen for me. Um, So it can really contribute to burnout and vicarious trauma and staff who are in our offices um, who are black, indigenous and people of color are often experiencing racism directly within their workplace, including microaggressions, workplace discrimination, lack of recognition that this might be happening for them. Um, yeah, hopefully, I think Kathleen is moving to a I'm different sorry. I, yeah, our, our office is the worst. It has all these dead zones and it was working so well in my office. I thought maybe it would stay okay, but it's not. <laughs> so hopefully now I'm like right next to the router. <laughs> oh, good. Um, but yeah, so just, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Kathleen. I was just kind of going through a little bit of what it says on the slide and was just talking about the fact that staff who are themselves from oppressed and marginalized groups may be additionally triggered and experiencing microaggressions in the workplace or at court, may not be getting recognition for the fact that that's an additional layer of stress that they're experiencing, um, lack of representation in their, potentially in their organizations. Um, yeah, so jump in if you have. Yeah, well, I just also just wanted to explicitly call out that, you know, this has been an enormous um, year of of racial reckoning and, um, and a, a, a new understanding for some folks about racial injustice, although a lot of us in the child welfare system see it every day. Um, it's been an extremely stressful time. Um, and I think that um, one thing that leaders and managers need to think about and supervisors need to think about is acknowledging racial trauma and calling it out and, and recognizing that folks 
um, are, are absorbing it every day. And so one thing that has been super helpful in our office is um, we have a racial justice study group that um, Maggie and our other social worker, Sadika Kumanika, uh, co-started, co-founded over the summer. And I don't know if you want to share with anybody about some of that, some of that because I think that work has just been, um, for all of our unit, just so helpful to kind of process a lot of the collective kind of trauma and grief. Yeah, just um, it's basically what Kathleen said. We're sort of studying different issues. We, we listen to some of the um, Seeing White podcasts. We have read different articles and, and some of it related really specifically to ch the child welfare field and how it has this history of racism, but also expanding beyond that to talk about different um, historical kind of uh, invention of race and racism and and how that has and whiteness and white supremacy and just unpacking that and we had to spend time also just acknowledging that we're coming from different places we have a diverse unit we um we you know set some kind of community agreements about how we would approach these conversations um and yeah i mean i think that like there's always more work to be done but we meet we meet with that group every two weeks and we kind of provide readings. We've invited a lot of different speakers or like guests to come and brainstorm with us. We've kind of tried to come up with both like visionary ideas and concrete potential steps that we can take to, to <laughs> abolish the system and, and make, make the world a better place. And, and also acknowledging individual stories and um, times that maybe people have, have, experience racism or, 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 you know, have something that they want to share from their personal lives as well. Yeah. And not to, not to make everyone jealous, but we got both Dorothy Roberts and Marty Guggenheim to come to our racial justice study group on separate times. So that's been amazing. And it's just been, yeah, a place of like, for like kind of a lot of sharing and healing. And I learned things about my coworkers that I didn't know before. And I feel so um, grateful for that. Um, so I'll turn it to the next slide. Um, but so yeah, we're going to, like? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, feel free to put into the chat some mm -hmm. of the ways I'm going to talk about some generic kind of information about how this might show up. And there's a lot more information in some of the material that we have in our files of, of examples of how this can show up. And I think it can be really unique to different individuals. Um, but yeah, please chat about how maybe have you seen that show up for yourself? Have you seen it show up for your colleagues? How do you keep an eye out on your own level to which you're feeling burnout? Or is there some sort of like canary in the coal mine of like, I know I'm getting there if I experience, you know, nightmares or um, irritab irritability with my kids or whatever it is. <laughs> Um, do you want to go to the next slide, Kathleen, and I'll mm -hmm. go over some of these, but I definitely would love to have people shout out some some specific ones in the chat. Um, the This is from the Educator Resilience and Trauma-Informed Self-Care, which is one of the files that's attached. Um, they called out kind of emotional, behavioral, physical, and cognitive different um, possible common reactions to trauma. So emotional being irritability, sadness, anxiety, guilt, grief, um, apathy. It can show up in so many different ways and it really can be very individualized. Um, behavioral, withdrawal, aggression, conflict, crying, um, increased risk taking, um, decline in job performance, changes in energy level, um, difficulty concentrating or communicating, um, headaches, stomach aches, heart racing, fatigue. I mean, so many of these different things can be symptoms of a lot of different things, but they can certainly be symptoms of stress and trauma. Um, and we may have heard of some of these things happening for our clients, and then we may start to see some of the same um, symptoms showing up in ourselves because we're taking on so much of that stress and so much of that, um, emp that empathy that we are feeling for how sad and how hard it is. Um, I love that, I love your comment, Robin, about um, many people have had their nervous systems harmed by trauma. So we need these, you know, possible strategies for grounding, for breathing, for addressing trauma, for um, coping with this, this uh, nervous system that we're, you know, stuff that we're taking on. Um, I think, Kathleen, you might have told me about that um, podcast with the sisters who talk about how to release trauma, oh, yeah. like, traumatic stress from your body. It's a really great um, podcast episode. I think it might be with Brene Brown. 
Yeah, it's the Unlocking Us uh, podcast by Brene Brown, um, and she, she did it about the, they called it the stress cycle, and basically you have to get through it. Like, and I think, I mean, I think one thing that I think about with this is um, for most of these things, we all experience them, and also there's no way of avoiding stress and trauma, and so you are going to see, uh, like, you're going to, you know, have a lot of these symptoms, right? And so, I, I mean, I think, um, I guess I, I, when sometimes I see these lists and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> there I am, right? Like, I, like, I definitely feel angry a lot of the time. Um, especially, like almost every time I go to court, I walk out furious, right? Um, for me, uh, it, uh, like kind of trauma reaction shows up as insomnia. Like I'll keep on replaying a trial over and over in my head and, you know, I kind of can't let things go. So, I mean, I, gu I guess I just want to say like, I, we're not pathologizing this. You are going to experience these things. They're there. You are, you are going to be stressed. Stress is like a normal part of life, but also th this, this career is going to put you in constant contact with trauma. Um, and so we just, there is a sense that like, if, it, you know, when it becomes heightened or when it becomes cumulative is when we really need to start worrying. And I think that in addition to this, I love this. And this is in one of your materials. There's another material that is, um, the family justice initiatives, um, tr trauma, sec secondary traumatic stress guide, and they also have a checklist. So like, look for these things in yourself. If you're checking off a lot of these boxes every day. Um, you might you might be having a serious trauma response. Yeah, and I love that. Um, just that it, that it is normal, especially in this work that's so difficult, and just figuring out what are our. And again, Kathleen and I don't really have this all figured out. We're just <laughs> spitballing and coming up with what well, you know these materials that we've seen. But um, there there isn't one right answer, and it, it may change over time. What your um, self care and and uh, boundaries and and everything need to look like. Um, you can go to the next mm -hmm. slide, Kathleen. Um, and so we do want to talk a little bit about the idea of resilience and promoting resilience in ourselves and in our staff. We don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about this because we know this is easier written up on a slide than <laughs> than achieved um, in our own lives or in our staff. Um, you know, uh, but but we wanted to talk about what is resilience and and what are some of the factors that impact resilience. Um, so yeah, to go to the next slide. Um, so again, you know, these aren't necessarily things that you can just go out and you know purchase or grab or you know I'm like okay I will add a <laughs> you know healthy coping style to my <laughs> to my plan, but. Um, but you know, these are things to just recognize in yourself or in others if you see them, to cultivate them, to appreciate them, to you know, recognize that these are some of the factors that contribute to resilience in the face of adversity. And I think again, with shouting people out and and building up our clients and their strengths, like just knowing that this is some of the stuff that I see in my clients all the time and have no problem calling, you know, shouting out. Um sense of control, meaning and purpose, a spiritual, a sense of spirituality, um, self-awareness, uh, humor, flexibility, um, positive thinking, adaptability. Kathleen and I also felt particularly um, ironic in the context of a global pandemic being like, go ahead and just have a sense of humor about everything. Like, <laughs> go ahead, go be positive. And it's like, yeah, that's harder. It's a lot harder when it actually is truly you're truly being tested by how you know much of a struggle it is to to be resilient when something really huge changes like our entire world um so so we know that this is um just one piece of the puzzle but but ooh, i like this question what can a sense of control look like in our work in terms of promoting our resilience i would love to hear what other people um have to say about that. I, I, I'm going to think about that for a second, but, um, yeah, I have, I mean, I, I, that's like, um, one of the kind of the reasons that I walk out of family court angry most days is a sense of like impotence and ineffectiveness and that, you know, nothing that I do matters. Um, and so that is that like, I don't have any control here. I mean, one thing that I feel like I've developed 
just over the years of doing this work is knowing that there are people that I've helped and like reflecting back, like it felt like I had, and I think about clients, like it felt like that was spiraling out of control. There was nothing I could do to help that person. And yet what I did actually ended up working that motion. I filed one, you know, and I try to like think about, and that's why we, we were talking earlier about like going back to the wins. Like you're going to lose. I mean, the reality of family defense is you're going to lose a lot. And it is going to be, even if you win and get the right result at the end, if you get a reunification or, or you, um, you know, win at an early shelter care hearing and get that baby home at three days, that baby was still separated from her mom for three days, right? And so there's still like constant unrelenting injustice, no matter how well you do, no matter how good of an attorney or a social worker or a member of a family defense team you are. And so like, I, I, I feel like, reflecting back on times that I that I did make a difference or that what I tried did work has helped me. Um, but yeah, that, that that is one of my biggest kind of challenges is trying to figure out how to feel like I'm effective in any way when the court is really designed um, for family defenders to be ineffective. I think also when I think of sense of control, um, I think of like that idea of like there's certain things that are in my control and there are certain things that are not in my control. And I think always taking a moment to reflect on like which aspects of my work are in my control and and maximizing my feeling of like positivity about the things that are in my control. So if I have the ability to set boundaries around how many hours I'm working or to um you know, to to kind of set a, a sense of like, this is what I want to achieve in this week or in this day and like make my to do list or like to to say that I'm going to take a lunch break or like just the things that I can that I can kind of control about because I can't control a lot. I can't control what is going on from the majority of what my clients are doing. And and I, you know, I sometimes I want to be able to use my powers of persuasion to, <laughs> to convince the client or to convince the team or to convince the judge um, of what I think is the right thing, you know, the right course of action or the right thing to, to have happen. But, um, you know, I, I, all I can do is control how I'm come, showing up and how I'm um, reacting to, yeah. To, to, I, I wanted to call out um, something that uh, somebody said in the chat that I found like was also really helpful and now I'm, I'm losing it. Um, it was Dor Dory said, I, I love all of these and I think they're really important. Um, think about how we interpret a win, right? So like, like for a client, a win might be that you got them an extra two hours a week with their kid. And so maybe that's your win and that, you know, even though their kid really doesn't belong in foster care, needs to be out of foster care like understanding that you did move the case forward. I love this, like checking in on saviorism. Like sometimes I like, I like, I, I know this, I am not the hero of the story. My client is the hero of the story, right? I'm like the Robin to their Batman. Like they are the ones doing the heavy lifting. They're the ones doing the hard work. And like, it's not in that sense of control. Like it's not, it's, this isn't my story. This is their story. I'm, the, I'm there to help them with their story. And so I think that is like a really important thing to reflect upon. And then focusing on long-term goals, I all these are all like really great ideas, because yeah, I mean you're not you are gonna walk out of court angry because you didn't get that kid home today. But like think about that. Okay, I, I get another court hearing in three months, and so there's there is some control coming, right? Um, I can do something else. There's more that I can do. Um, I think we can go to the next slide, but definitely love um, all of the comments that are coming in and. Um, hope everybody's writing down all of these different ideas. I definitely am. Um, so this was also just specific to COVID times. Um, I was looking for additional material around like how to specifically cope with this difficult job during this particular moment. And this was from the Suicide Prevention Lifeline organization. I think these are just really nicely concrete, um, doable for the most part, like ideas. And I, I felt like all of them were ones that I have definitely struggled with or tried to work on during the pandemic of like, 
setting a limit on my media consumption, including social media, especially during particular moments in the pandemic, that was super important for me. Understanding what's going on is really important that get ac accurate health information from reputable sources, but not like spiraling into reading every <laughs> terrible article about, about how this is playing out. Um, staying active, making sure to get enough sleep and rest, hydrating, avoiding um, excessive amounts of caffeine and alcohol, eating healthy foods. Um, all of these, I think, are a little bit like personal. Those are your personal decisions about which of, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm already championing ice cream as a every day, every, <laughs> every meal kind of item. But I think for me, it has been true that I let myself get really, I didn't leave the house. I was sitting a lot. I wasn't having the kind of normal day-to-day -day activity that I would have had in my life before pandemic, um, making sure to get to bed on time. Like I let that slide. Like there were moments during the pandemic where all of these things were things I needed to check in with myself about. Um, and which, you know, just, I guess, basically the takeaway is like, pay attention to your, your physical needs. Don't ignore the fact that you have a body and it's <laughs> something you need to care for, maybe especially during a pandemic. Um, yeah, I feel, and I feel like just to be totally frank, like I, all of these went to hell for me <laughs> in the pandemic, yeah. especially at the beginning. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, I did all of this wrong, um, completely, including constantly checking the news and working myself up into a front. I mean, all, literally all of right. it. Right. <laughs> so. yes. No, same, same. And again, I don't want to be, there's no judgment yeah. here. This is like, yeah do what works for you. But I thought these were some good tips. <laughs> and then connecting with loved ones and others who may be experiencing stress or just enjoying conversation unrelated to, to COVID. Um, and then the next slide. Mm -hmm. So this is really about what we can do in our workplace to get to those um, resilience points um, that are so incredibly hard to get to and even harder now that we're in the middle of COVID. Um, but some of these, uh, there are things you can do. And so we want to call out some of these. Maggie, did you want to go through this one and I'll do the next one? I can't remember. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we've talked about this a little bit already, but just as Kathleen said, like talking about this stuff makes a huge difference. Acknowledging stuff. I think Robin has mentioned the sanctuary model, but just like the acknowledgement that stuff is going on makes a huge difference for the culture of a community and for the ability for people to kind of say like, okay, it's been acknowledged. My stress or, or the difficulties that we're all experiencing, um, that, that helps. That goes a long way. Um, so that's also kind of the normalizing conversation around these topics, helping make sure people understand the concepts, are familiar with the idea of vicarious trauma and secondary trauma. Um, you know, attempting to ch change the workplace and organizational culture, if you have any control over that, what are the expectations around work-life balance, break time, um, creating a supportive atmosphere, the shout outs maybe is one way to do that, but also there are other ways to kind of have that, those check-ins, individual check-ins or, um, you know, an open door policy or what, you know, if, when we were together. Um, and this is one that I don't always do the best job with, but like, I think sometimes we can vent to each other in a way that might just kind of, um, you know, then put that trauma onto the next person. And, 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 and so just being sensitive when, um, you know, potentially when discussing the really stressful cases or the really sad things, like asking if somebody's ready to be a, um, a container for some of that for you in that moment. Um, and, and saying like, I'd really love to vent about something difficult or do you have some time? Do you have the emotional bandwidth to, to listen? Um, it can be, it can be really nice. Yeah. I think like for me, like the bottom line for all of these, um, is really ca like calling this stuff out, <laughs> not pretending it's not the elephant in the room when we're doing this work because it absolutely is and so like normalizing conversation around this just feels really important um like just to give an example from covid um once covid hit um it was extremely stressful for us but like horrible 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 for our clients um you know the agency workers stopped answering their phones um, visits were completely suspended. Our clients were just, you know, also going through a global pandemic. And there was a sense of like, you know, our clients were really spiraling at the time that everything also felt really uncertain for us. Um, and 
a lot of us, a lot of us. And then also we're working from home, right? And so your laptop's in your bedroom. And so a lot of us were like working around the clock um, because because we were the only ones who pick up the phone for our clients. The agency workers weren't there, weren't scheduling visits, weren't providing any services. And so there was that sense of like, oh my gosh, this is all falling on us. Um, so like, and, and, and that's not sustainable, right? We, none of us can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's just not sustainable. There has to be a culture of setting boundaries and creating work-life balance. And like when you hit a new bump in the road or a challenge or, um, you know, a, a cataclysm like COVID, like you really have to be intentional about that in your workplace. So one thing that we did like pretty early on that I found helpful and I know some of our, our other newer staff did was we just had a staff meeting that was all about how to set boundaries, like work-life boundaries. And like, okay, what are we gonna agree to do together um, to, to support each other in having boundaries right now? Um, and we actually, right, right before the pandemic started, we hired three new staff, and then all of a sudden they were kind of thrust into this pandemic and working from home and, I think they felt a sense of obligation to like to do the 24 seven thing and be there for the clients. And um, so we actually like spent an hour of staff time with everybody on staff. And, you know, we're lucky enough to have some people on staff who have been here for 40 years to talk about, like, what are your strategies? What can you do? Like, how do you um, how do you manage this? How do you make sure that you can be available for crises, but also for clients, but also kind of be able to get up and do this work again the next day. And I felt like that was a really helpful meeting to kind of just say, we're talking about this and we're making a plan together. Like what does self-care look like for us right now? Um, I am gonna go to the next one. And this is a lot of these overlap, but I also wanted to call out this, um, the, the FJI document again, that's in your handout has a lot of office space ideas for a lot of this. and. Um, we're about to get into trauma-informed supervision and Maggie's going to share some strategies for trauma-informed supervision. Again, calling it out um, through training and education, like having it be part of your orientation for new staff and then encouraging people to come to places like this, like encouraging your staff to go into spaces like this where they can kind of share and um, vent with each other and, and come up with strategies together. Um, we haven't actually explicitly called out peer support. And I think that has been so crucial for, I don't know how I would have survived this without the family advocacy unit at CLS. Like um, we really lean on each other a lot. And I just, I really recognize that not everyone has that kind of built in structure of working in a family defense office. Um, and so peer support might have to look different. Peer support could look like this, right? You guys are all here in this room today. We're here telling you, yes, it sucks. <laughs> um, so I hope that's helpful. Uh, and you know, I think reaching out through networks, through the ABA parent attorney network, through the family justice initiative, coming to conferences, um, trying to find other people who are doing what you're doing, listening to someone like Marty talk and can remind you, you're not the crazy one, right? Like that's all peer support that helps kind of promote resilience going forward. Um, and then I, I, I want to continue to work on this, like modeling self-care. Like I do try to model self-care as much as possible, but I also am like, oh, if the laptop's next to my bed, I'm going to send five more emails before I go to sleep. Um, I, I hope that I, I've said it and I hope that people know, like I'm sending you this email at 10 p.m. just because I'm going to forget if I don't, but it's not because I expect you to respond to it at 10 p.m. And I, I think we have a culture in the unit that folks know that that, you know, um, is not expected. Um, but, you know, talking about self-care, talking about what some something you did this weekend or what you made for dinner or whatever, like modeling that and being really intentional about it. And then listening to your folks that you work with about what they have to say about what would help them. Um, because what works for me is not necessarily going to be what works for other people on my staff. Lots of more like concrete ideas around this. And then just so you know, in the FJI document, if you want to look at it, they actually have examples of uh, programs across the country and how they implement these different things. Um, I'll let you take this one, Maggie. Yeah. So this is just another couple quotes from this woman, Jen Alexander. She, again, has this blog that you can check out. I put the information at the bottom of the slide. 
Um, she talks a lot about trauma. She talks about it from an education kind of standpoint, but I think you could very easily substitute the words workplace or supervisor in some of these quotes. But, um, you know, the anniversary of the beginning of the pandemic really brought up a lot of emotions for people. Um, anniversaries of any type of traumatic experience or big change can bring up different reactions for people. And this will be true of the pandemic, which is a collective trauma. And so creating space for acknowledging the anniversary of this collective trauma is another opportunity to demonstrate um, taking good care of one another. And I think like, you know, the, the, the actual anniversary has come, you know, somewhat recently, and there, there may be other anniversaries that people are experiencing through this spring. I think also at this point, we're sort of looking at this like, return kind of to work or to no normal um, that may be bringing up stress for people as well in, in other ways of like um, trying to think about re-entering society or, or the office or um, things that we used to do that have been scary for a while. Um, and I love this quote, trauma sensitive um, supervisors or managers don't ignore the hard stuff of life. They understand that life is full of suffering and joy, both, and neither topic is off limits at the workplace or in supervision. In fact, healing and how it happens must matter to us. It must matter in the workplace because anything that matters is given space, time, and care. So I just, I loved that idea. And I think we can all, um, you know, do more to make sure that we are offering time, space, and care to ourselves and to our each other and to um, just, yeah, not ignore that hard stuff of life because it's part of what we're all bringing to work. I'm noticing in the chat, I have some fellow Brene Brown fans. <laughs> I'm like totally a Brene Brown fangirl, <laughs> setting Maggie's yeah. up at the time. But um, Brene Brown says, um, daring leaders are never silent about hard things. And so that's COVID, that's racial justice, that's trauma and stress. It's all of it. Like you can't be silent about any of the hard things and expect people to show up and want to work for you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I love that. Love Brene. Good. All right, so now we want to talk to you guys some more. Um, I'm loving the chat, and I'm loving hearing from you guys. And um, uh, but we want to kind of uh, hear from you some answers to some questions, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the things we do. But I really want to hear from you first. The question around like what can an organ organization do right now in the middle of COVID to create a trauma-informed workplace? Like organizationally, if you are part of an organization, if you have a role in how an organization is, is managed or if you're a supervisor, like what can organizations do right now? Maggie, do you want to start with any thoughts that you have? I definitely have a bunch. <laughs> yeah, um, I can't remember if this is on a different slide later, but I know we had talked a little bit about um, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot when I'm talking about trauma with like respect to thinking about clients is the idea of predictability and setting expectations and managing expectations. And so something that I think can be really helpful is just uh, being transparent and sharing information and setting expectations to the extent that, we can, that, that the organization can. And I think our executive director at CLS has been good about having periodic updates about what, you know, how long, how long do we know that the office is going to be closed for, or like when is our potential start back date and, and just kind of having that information, like whatever information she does have or know, or, or think even things about like, what is our budget looking like, or like what kind of um, things that might be changes coming down the pike, having that information ahead of time and, and then offering time where like as a full staff, she's kind of giving these updates and and allowing for questions to be asked or concerns to be raised. Um, I think that that can be really um, trauma informed. Yeah, I think I think especially during periods of intense ambiguity, what people want are answers, and like sometimes you don't have answers to give them, and so I think sometimes leaders freak out and shut down themselves because they're like, I don't know, I don't have any answers, but I think. Um, you know, being a trauma informed leader means that you are recognizing that people are in stress and trauma and then saying, I, I, I don't know the answer, but here's what I'm going to do to get to the answer. And here's what I'm going to check in with you again. Right. And so it has been really helpful for our executive director to have, like, she has like all staff meetings where it's like an AMA, ask me anything, like put whatever questions you have in the chat You take yourself off, off mute and just ask me like whatever you want. If you don't want to do it in the middle of a meeting, 
shoot me an email, like really kind of trying to be as transparent as possible. And, and, you know, say, I don't know if you don't know, but then, you know, say when you will try to try to follow up and find the answer. I feel like um, talking to other people that hit home really hard at the beginning of COVID, like that first and second week of March where it's like, what is happening right now? And then I, you know, I had friends and family who were working in places that are like, I, no one's telling me anything. Am I supposed to show up at work on Monday? Like, I, I don't know. And so I think that kind of like transparent communication is like such an important trauma informed strategy for a workplace. I love this um, comment that Kelsey um, put in of uh, kind of two parts of like recognizing, like recognizing that people are struggling and that, that is normal in a situation like this um, or could be normal in any, you know, people go through moments where they're struggling in, in all parts of life. But certainly right now, everyone is under a lot of stress and could be struggling. And so having flexibility, having less rigid policies, having just a like, yeah, a, a um empathy for for the folks that you're working with of like they may be coming from a place of stress right now this this, this may be something that they're struggling with um consistency and logic um even though the court is not going to be in person they're forcing everyone back to the office hmm, yeah it sounds like in that situation there isn't a consistency and so that can be stressful um Self, safety, emotional management, team meetings, psychoeducation, and meetings should be democratic. No one is more important than the other guy. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I think, like, in addition to good communication, like, equitable policies are really so important and announcing policies that are equitable. And, like, we recognize when the pandemic hit, like, a lot of us have kids and so, and schools closed. And so that means, like, in addition, to our full-time jobs, we're also full-time teachers. And what does that mean? And and then are and then people, oh my God, God bless the people who had babies and toddlers, because you know, like where you really can't look away for a moment. Um, like how do you do that work? And so I feel like our boss was like really great about saying, it's okay. It's okay. Like, you know, we're we're not going to penalize you for for this. Like take the time that you need. We're not going to take it out of your vacation time. Like um, that has been a really helpful helpful thing during COVID. Yes, I will definitely say as the parent of young children who I am now homeschooling and being the daycare for, I uh, have really appreciated the flexibility from both Kathleen and our, our upper management. Um, do you want to go to the next slide, Kathleen? I think there might be some more examples. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I think we're, we, we're getting into some of these um, examples. This is from an organization. Um, again, it's in the files, Trauma Informed Oregon. It's a longer kind of document, but I think these were some just great ideas that I really liked. Um, we talked about the idea of helping staff know to, what to expect to the extent possible. In uncertain times, having any amount of certainty or predictability is helpful. Um, and I, again, like I talk about this a lot with clients and with um being trauma informed in general, like I use this as a as a strategy with like many of my interactions with other people of like, I'm, you know, I've gotten several phone calls from you. I am, you know, I have 20 minutes to talk to you today and I'm, but I'm going to schedule a longer block of time for us to check in on Friday. Does that work? You know, like this is just, this is how much I can do right now. Um, oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> Dory. <laughs> Pandemic babies. Amazing. Yes. Um, supporting people in their regulation. When people are stressed, they have a harder time managing their emotions and staying regulated. We all have that struggle. Um, and you know, that again, all, so much of this applies to like the ways that we encounter our clients, but also how we encounter each other in, in a situation where we're all under stress. Um, build in time for regulation practices. Um, Robin was talking about these breathing exercises, grounding exercises, model the calm behavior that you want the staff to mirror. Um, and, and also to help you get through it yourself. Um, prioritizing relationships, uh, social support and connection can buffer st a stress response. And I think this is again, what Kathleen was talking about with our staff meetings of like some of the staff meeting is um, our unit meetings are, are you know, logistics or ca case, you know, updates or whatever, but some, a, a good portion of each of them is just connecting with each other, just seeing each other, being together, um, you know, doing those highs and lows, doing those shout outs um, to, to prioritize our relationships with each other and not letting them slide. 
Um, I Some of the folks who started, we had one lawyer who started in during the pandemic and she and I have a, a every morning we call each other to check in because when we were in the office, she, she was an intern with us several years ago. And when we were in the office, she would stop by my office every morning to say hi and just do a quick like, how was your you know day or how was your weekend? And so we do that by FaceTime now. <laughs> and I felt like for a new staff member, like that's a really important thing to make sure that we are building up relationships um, and are continuing them. Um, understanding the why behind decisions and reframing behaviors. It's important to remember that emotional regulation and impulse control are difficult during this time. And people may not be showing up as their best selves all the time. And we need to give everyone, including ourselves, I know somebody said this, I think it might've been Dory, but it might've been somebody else saying, be kind to yourself, be kind to each other, recognize that we might be bringing, you know, this might not be bringing out the best in all of us all every day. <laughs> um, so having that benefit of the doubt for each other and for ourselves. Yeah, I love that last one is around COVID. And, you know, we were in a lot of conflict around COVID with agency workers and the agency itself as visits got suspended and um, lots of really hard conversations and negotiations were happening on our cases and also at the systemic level. And um, I just kept on trying to remind myself, like, no one is their best self right now. Like, and please have, try to have grace and recognize no one is showing up as their best self right now. I don't, I don't know how you could show up as your best self um, in, in, like, in this kind of time. So trying to remind myself of that and um, kind of not take it personally and, and try to find a way through the weeds anyway. Um, I, I love that point. I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about some supervision strategies, Maggie. Yeah, just really briefly, um, I at one point took a little mini course on trauma-informed supervision. So I'm pulling a few, um, you know, ideas and concepts from Ida Kaufman, who's one of the professors at the University of Pennsylvania, and she um, developed this trauma-informed supervision um, materials. And she talked about supervision as this kind of... Um, three part or like, you know, has like these three different kind of uh, pieces to it. And and we focus a lot sometimes on the administrative piece of supervision. We talk about, and this was, I supervise like student interns. So I think about this sometimes from like a supervising a student who's here, you know, on an internship, but I think it applies um, to, to other types of supervision, you know, task supervision, what, you know, checking in about the clients, totally, you know, um, focused on like what needs to get done between now and the next time that we meet. Um, that's an important piece, but it's only one piece of the puzzle and it can become kind of like overshadowing of the other pieces. And so, you know, clinical supervision in a social work context is really about skill development. And so I think, you know, for lawyers, it might also be just like focusing on that brief that you're writing or like a new experience or your, um, you know, what conferences are you gonna attend or what professional development do you need? But then there's that also that third piece of being supportive and checking in again to um, that that idea of like, you know, you, supervisors aren't therapists. So there's obviously a boundary around this at some point, but like just making sure that someone like where are they coming from that day? How are they feeling? Are they feeling supported? Do they have a sense of um, safety in this relationship? And, and you know, doing something simple, as simple as just like seeing where they are that day or how they're doing that day or, you know, what's going on for them outside of the context of, of work can be can go a long way to building that trust and that supportive feeling in that relationship. Um, so it, just including that as a piece of the mentorship or supervision that you're providing. Um, and then the next slide, I think, goes into a little bit more of another piece of that. Um, this self uh, checklist is self is this um, Robin has been referencing the sanctuary model by um, Sandra Bloom. Um, this is one of the, the concepts and acronyms from that um, that tool, and and its self is safety, emotions, loss, and future. And so the idea that Ida Kaufman came up with is that when you're doing a, a check in with your supervisee, you can actually check in about all of these different kind of categories. And safety is really about you know could be physical, emotional, social, moral, but, you know, obviously in the context of a pandemic, it, it definitely can be like, do I feel safe? Do I feel supported? Do I feel trusted? You know, what what could be potentially emerging issues around safety that, that may be impacting the way that you're working? 
um, emotions, what emotions have emerged? Are we managing them? Is there any emotional management that's causing the particular challenge that we're trying to address? Loss um, and letting go. Are we holding on to behaviors that are impeding growth? Are there issues of loss that we need to address? Is there loss that's causing challenges? And I think I really love this idea of acknowledging loss because I think sometimes we don't think about the fact that any change, even a change that's potentially viewed largely as a positive change or a promotion or a, a you know, any kind of like thing that we would generally see as positive can also involve some element of, um, of, of, of loss. Maybe it's just that who you're working with or, or what your schedule looked like or, or an attachment that you had to a particular aspect of your previous um, caseload or, or whatever, but acknowledging that loss, that, that, sadness, that potential for um, for a loss and a letting go is is huge and being able to move to that final step of what's the future? What are our goals and plans? Um, how can we move towards planning? And I think this applies a lot with, um, with clients as well. But yeah, I, I think um, Mary's making a really great point about like the new normal. And I think like this loss idea is so prevalent in, in our lives right now of like, I can actually see at this point some of the silver linings of <laughs> the pandemic, but there's so many things that we lost. Um, and some people truly lost individuals in their lives, could have lost their housing, could have lost their jobs, could have lost their income. You know, there's so many things, but also losses of things just like, um, like we were talking about early, earlier in the presentation of, of getting to connect with clients or getting to go to court or getting to have my, you know, favorite coffee date with a friend from, you know, um, in the office. So, so that's just a really nice little tool. And then I think move along, Kathleen, we're running, running out of time. We only have two more things. Do you want to do this one? I could do the next one, Maggie. Or... Sure. Yeah, we, this is just a tool that, that we included, um, that you can use if you, if you feel compelled, it's a nice, like little image of the tree and the roots and kind of going through for yourself, like, how do I, it's, it's called a professional preservation plan. It's from our, one of our other organizations in Philly, the support center for child advocates, um, talking about like, what are my signs of stress? What are the rewards of the work that I do? What is my motivation for doing this work? What are some of the triggers that might set me off? Like Kathleen was talking about like particular courtrooms or like, you know, experiences that inevitably you walk away feeling, frustrated and, and powerless? Um, and what are some of the boundaries that I can put in place and the healthy practices that I can put in place to help me manage? If I know these are some of the things that are red flags, these are some of the things that could potentially trigger me. Here are some of the things that I can connect back to about like, why do I do this work? And how does it, you know, feel good? And um, this one is is not necessarily tied to employment, but I've, I I like this one a lot. Like uh, the idea that you have your own self care plan and you've thought about it. Um, I think Robin or Robin had put the chat like when you are in trauma, like thinking clearly and thinking like future thinking becomes very impaired, right? And so we're we all get to those uh, like kind of points where we really need to really need some strategies. And so I like the idea of like writing out your strategies ahead of time. Like, what am I going to do when I start to feel overwhelmed? And like, what are things that help my mind, body and spirit? I really love this. And I love thinking about like for each one, like, well, what if I am reaching that point? What am I going to do for my body? Right? What am I going to do for my mind? Um, I also love the supportive people because sometimes like when you're like when you when you really are in trauma, we know the best buffer there is to trauma in the world is connection, right? Like uh, connection is the buffer to trauma. So thinking through who are my people? How do I get to connection when I am kind of starting to spiral a little bit? And I like that this guy just wrote out his list, right? Um, and then this idea of like, where, where, what am I trying to do? What do I want out of life? Like, so I would encourage you to think about what this is for you. I mean, for so, some of these, I overlap with Ignacia. Like I love eight hours of sleep, but I hate tea. So like, what are, what is, what is on your list and how do you get to that place? And one thing I notice is like my kind of long wandering walks are like for me like hit every every one of those things like body mind and spirit and, you know so are there things like that that are kind of like in the middle of that circle for you 
Um, I just I just thought this was like a really good tool to kind of think in advance and meditate on. Um, and I think, uh, Maggie, you can take this one and then we're done. Oh, yeah. Well, so we did just want to include information about the National Suicide Prevention um, Lifeline and website and resources. Um, you know, this really has been an incredibly stressful year. It has really been such a hard time for so many of us. And we just want to acknowledge that it can be normal to also experience real um, real challenges around your mental health. And, and if you do feel like you or anyone you know needs these resources, we wanted to make sure that we included them and to let everyone know that who you are is important, what you're doing is important, and we, you know, we want you to all be safe and cared for. Um, and I think they're telling us we're out of time almost. So um, this is how you can reach us. And we love talking about this. I hope you can tell. And um, we would love to hear from any of you. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Wow, we will end it like right on four o'clock. <laughs> All, right. All right, I'm heading back to the waiting room then. <laughs>